You're most welcome. And uh, our next presentation is from Dr. Brad Farmalo, who's a DELP scientist at ARI, and um, Chase Aiken, who's a project officer for forest, fire, and parks for Wadawurrung Traditional Owners Aboriginal Corp Corporation. So um, Chase and Brad are going to be talking about two ways of knowing natural temperate grasslands of the Victorian volcanic plains. And just to give you a little bit of background, um, I mentioned that Brad's an ecologist at ARI who's interested in applied ecological research to improve the management of grassland and woodland systems in Victoria. He's focused on the ecological values of these critically endangered grassy systems, but all, is also interested in the cultural values these hold for traditional owners. So Brad works with researchers, management agencies and landowners to ensure the long-term survival of the grassy ecosystem that holds immense cultural, ecological and economic value for Victorians. And Chase is a good Jintamara man who has studied both conservation and land management, management and Aboriginal cultural heritage management. And he's currently the project officer for Wadawurrung, as I mentioned, um, by working on the diverse landscapes that influence Wadawurrung country in collaboration with numerous partners, he hopes to achieve the best outcomes for country. And although much of country has been modified by previous land uses, Chase believes incorporating Western science and indigenous knowledge can provide great outcomes for healing country. So thank you, Brad and Chad. I'll hand them to you both. Yeah, thanks for that, Michelle. Um, I'd just like to um, acknowledge traditional owners on all the lands we're on today and pay respects to elders, past and present, and our emerging leaders. I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm on Wadawurrung country. Uh, my name is Chase Agin. I'll be co-presenting with uh, Brad Farmelow on the two ways of knowing natural temperate grasslands of the Victorian volcanic plains. Grasslands hold very important values culturally and ecologically in southeast Australia. Before colonisation, grasslands were looked after for thousands of years by First Nations peoples. Grasslands were cared for in natural land management regimes, such as fire stick farming to stimulate growth of plants and to attract animals. Grasslands were burned sustainably and used as corridors for access and hunting for kangaroos and other species. They were a great resource for staple foods such as seeds of flour, tuberous roots like the Murnong that were abundant in the area. Grasslands and wetlands in the Victorian volcanic plains have many resources for weepy baskets and dilly bags. These resources provide for many communities and enable them to sustain residency throughout the Victorian volcanic plains. The Victorian volcanic plains consist of predominantly of grasslands, wetlands and grassy woodlands. This was before colonial grazing and agricultural practices fragmented the landscape and displaced Aboriginal communities. Our grasslands are important vegetation and home to many important species. But due to the significant reduction in the area and changes to management, for example, loss of fire stick farming, grasslands and the species they contain are now one of Australia's most threatened communities. Coupled with risks associated with climate change and urbanisation, grasslands require immediate help to restore cultural values, ecological services and populations of threatened species. To achieve the best outcomes for restoring the cultural and ecological values in our threatened grasslands requires good partnerships between traditional owners and land managers as disturbances created through manager, management, for example, cultural burning is the key to good outcomes for grassland communities. There are two dominant ways of knowing natural landscapes, traditional knowledge and Western knowledge. They both rely on observation, prediction, hypothesis testing and making generalizations. However, they are also inherently different in their approach and properties, yet they can work together to improve natural vegetation and health of country. Traditional knowledge focuses on the aesthetics of the area as a cultural landscape, knowing seasons changing climates and patterns in nature, such as breeding seasons of fauna populations and harvesting seasons of flora species that it influence sustainable land management and living and have been relearned in recent times. These practices are an important communication tool to inform about the creation period, animals, plants, and other beings. The continuation and obligations to care for country is vital in many aspects of traditional knowledge. Western knowledge, which here we base on the origins of the scientific method. Western science or knowledge has had a major influence in how we look after country today. Western science sometimes separates itself from nature by isolating objects from their context and placing them in a more simplified and controllable exploratory environment. 
Western science relies on certain components and methods to analyze our ecosystems and biodiversity. So monitoring data analysis have proved our knowledge of the current and previous land changes. It is also attempting to make predictions about the future. Western science has been created over shorter time frames, and the transferal of information is academic and literate. The two ways of knowing shares different perspectives from one another on the same subject. The two ways of knowing is an essential element in positive partnerships and decision making. Combining Western and traditional approaches is an important aspect when implementing strategies to manage country. Combining Western and traditional approaches empowers both land managers and traditional owners to be the right decision makers and to focus on a more holistic view when implementing future management prospects. Without biodiversity, our ecosystems will become unbalanced. If our grasslands are not cared for, we lose our significant species and biodiversity. Approaching management regimes in a holistic way, we can recover biodiversity loss in our grasslands. Policies are becoming more aware of traditional knowledge and supporting traditional owners' self-determination and preservation of ind Indigenous knowledge systems. Working collaboratively enables both Western and traditional approaches to deliver more informed decisions on grassland management. Traditional land manage management practices have a vital role and an obligation of First Nations people in healing country. Cultural practices are taken away from the landscape, it will become sick. Indigenous culture is alive and vibrant in our natural ecosystems and carried out in many ways, whether it's through song, dance, stories, fire and other practices. With the aid of Western knowledge, we can identify previous land uses and vegetation changes. Using a traditional knowledge approach, we can implement obligations to care for country, traditional ways as First Nations people have done for tens and thousands of years. Unfortunately, there are too many instances where traditional owners are the last ones to be consulted or not at all on many projects. This is not an effective partnership or management agreement. Therefore, we hope that by sharing our willingness to work together as a partnership that respectfully engages with two ways of knowing, traditional and Western, we'll begin, we'll begin to break down barriers and make progress towards an equitable approach to land management in Victoria. However, it can be difficult to analyse one form of knowledge using the criteria of another. Fulvio Mazzocchi states in his report on Western science and traditional knowledge, trying to analyse and validate traditional knowledge systems by using external scientific criteria carries the risks of distorting such systems in the process. At the same time, we cannot extract just those parts of traditional knowledge that seem to measure up to scientific criteria and ignore the rest. This process of cognitive mining would atomize the overall system and threaten traditional knowledge with dispossession. The following case study of Grassland Point Lilius involved many people with an array of expertise. We all came together on a collaborative approach by exercising and combining the two ways of knowing to produce a grassland vegetation monitoring program to inform grassland management. Many organizations, including Arthur Ryle Institute, Wadrong Traditional Owners Aboriginal Corporation, the Blue Carbon Lab, Karangamite CMA, Parks Victoria, Coast Care Victoria and Heritage Insights came together to discuss the pointless area and future management prospects. A team of scientists, researchers, archaeologists and traditional owners all participated and shared views and knowledge of the Point Lilies area. Readings held on what our own country provided to share views and perspectives on future land management regimes in a respectful and informative approach. The Point Lilies project is a component of the Victorian Wetlands Restoration Pro Project, Blue Carbon, which was funded by DALP's Biodiversity Response Planning. The intentions of the project were to support Wadarong traditional owners Aboriginal Corporation in managing country of Point Lilies. This was achieved by creating a grassland vegetation monitoring program that was informed by two ways of knowing, which Brad will speak to this later. Point Lilies is a cultural landscape situated on the peninsula at the eastern end of the Victorian Volcanic Plains, which was formed on basalt newer volcanics up to two and a half to five million years ago. Point Lilies was created from a southward flow of lava from the volcanic flows of the Werribee Plains. Pre-colonial times, the area was occupied by the Wadawurrung people. The Point Lilies study area is 60 hectares and is composed of critically endangered natural temperate grassland within the Victorian volcanic plain bioregion. 
Point Lilies is listed as a wetland of international importance and is the subsite of the Port Phillip Bay, Ballerine Peninsula Ramsar site. Point Lilies sits within a broader landscape. The Yu Yangs are a significant element on Wadawurrung country and can be seen from Point Lilies site. The Yu Yangs is situated 16 kilometres north of Point Lilies. There are drawings that depicted women harvesting for tuberous fruits and other resources around the area of the Port Phillip Bay. Archaeological evidence shows that Wadawurrung people occupy what is now known as Point Lilius. Tangible cultural heritage found within the site included shell middens, artifact scatters and stone features such as fish traps. Evidence suggests Point Lilius was used as several resources and was occupied by the Wadawurrung pre and post contact. Shell middens can determine the timing and types of food predominantly eaten and harvested. They can also be used to determine the Wadawurrung diet by examining the size and the type of shellfish consumed. The extent of the shell middens of Point Lilies are one of the largest recorded in the area. Shellfish represented in the middens included turbo, mud oyster, wedge clam, arc shell, sand cockle, blue mussel and limpets. The shellfish harvested would have been a plenty in the area and provided for large gatherings. However, evidence of Aboriginal cultural heritage does not entirely re revolve around stones and bones. It also includes your plants and resources and the whole cultural landscapes that are connected to each other. This can be songlines and stories that have been passed on by many generations, many of which have been retained and continue to be retold. So I think it's now my turn, Chase, to, to take over. So Chase, for those in the audience, uh, he's going to continue to use the slides. So hopefully that, that works for us. And hopefully everyone's hearing me nice and clearly. Um, yeah, thanks very much to Chase. And I'm Brad from ARI. I'm presenting from Wurundjeri Country, where I pay my respects to traditional owners, past, present and future. Um, Hi to everyone. I see many familiar faces in the audience, um, so hello. So Chase has provided a nice introduction to the two ways of knowing and has taken us to the study area, Point Lilies, to identify those important geological, cultural and ecological aspects of the landscape. At this point, I'd like to provide a little bit more detail on the cultural, I'm um, sorry, the ecological aspects of Point Lilies before describing how we tried to apply these two ways of knowing into this monitoring program. Unfortunately, at this point, we do not have data to present. Um, instead, we wish to use this as an opportunity to allow the audience to engage with these ideas of two ways of knowing and to describe a case study where we've tried to incorporate the thinking uh, into a grassland vegetation monitoring program. We hope perhaps later down the line that we can provide a, um, a follow up with some data to demonstrate the progress on the, on, the, on the project and the ongoing relationships that have been formed in the early stages of this project. So Chase, next slide please mate. So the ecological background, um, the vegetation at Point Elias is largely a coastal tussock grassland which grades into more coastal vegetation at the margins. Um, it's made up of native grasses which are predominantly um, spear and wallaby grasses and uh, some wildflowers occur in, in relatively low abundance. The structure of the grassland is dense with high biomass and there are a number of weeds on the site um, that are also in high abundance. Um, these are predominantly grasses, but there are also some thistles and other herb species there as well. Next slide, please, Chase. So the point of this project where we're combining these two ways of knowing and, and trying to incorporate that into a monitoring program um, forms part of a much larger and collaborative effort that Chase has already kind of spoken to with lots of moving parts and um, collaborative approach. As Point Lilius is a kind of a, a coastal grassland which requires management to, re to protect the rich cultural assets and restore the vegetation, it was deemed the perfect place for a case study that would explore these two ways of knowing and generate a partnership approach to coastal grassland management. Ultimately, the task was to design a grassland vegetation monitoring program to inform grassland management. Um, Unfortunately, the aspects of grasslands that are valued and the threats to grassland health and also the goals of a monitoring program are often viewed predominantly through uh, the lens of Western science. So we wanted to use this as an opportunity to consider alternate views, uh, in particular those held by traditional owners and, and try and, um, as that image depicted earlier by Chase, look at the landscape through a different lens. Uh, I think we, we can, we're all capable of that. Therefore, an emphasis was placed on being consultative and to spend time sharing knowledge from both ways of knowing, such that the monitoring program can inform the role of grassland management on improving values and reducing threats that speak to both 
both knowledge um, knowledge views. Next slide, please, Chase. So to determine what information the monitoring program should capture, we needed to discuss those aspects of grassland that each way of knowing values and the threats that will require management to avoid degradation of those values. So in terms of the values that we discussed, there was um, many that sort of overlapped where, you know, this the similar value was held from both both knowledge um, centers. And so those are those are in blue there where the vegetation should be largely comprised of native species, that wildflowers are vital both as an indicator of grassland condition, but also as a resource um, and that providing habitat for fauna was important. Uh, in other cases, the values were more closely aligned with a particular way of knowing. So uh, native species diversity, so, so John mentioned earlier native species richness, which is the number of species within an area. Diversity is sort of that with also incorporating a bit of information about how many there are of each species. Um, this was a, an, a concept which is much more aligned with Western knowledge as it relates to a very quantitative approach to understanding vegetation. Um, and if you can see in the in the image there on the right, we've sort of got a trophic cascade where we, we place arrows and numbers and values and widths and things to, to try and understand vegetation. Uh, if we look at things through the other lens, uh, there are other values that were, were more cultural and, and um, uh, based in traditional knowledge and these were things like evidence of cultural practices um, as these relate to cultural indicators that can often be overlooked by, by Western scientists. Uh, next please Chase. So now to the threats. Um, of those threats that could have been altered with grassland management, both ways of knowing identified weed invasion as the primary threat um, to be um, uh, to the predetermined values and um, as these weeds are often you know, really competitive and we'll, we'll give it an opportunity to grade all of those values that we've already deemed to be important. However, some nuance existed when we discussed the types of weeds that are of concern. Um, and a story I like to tell to kind of explain this and sort of my own journey in trying to un understand two ways of knowing um, was, is based on a conversation that I had with a, a man named Sean Kelly, who was representing Wadarong when we met on country. Um, when we discussed the threats to Point Lilius, most suggestions revolved around weeds. Other ideas included things like sea level rise, and um, but this was largely outside of the scope of our project. Um, when I asked the group which species of weeds were of most concern, Sean indicated that the wild oat, uh, which is an invasive tall annual grass, which is pictured on the left there, was a significant threat to, to the health of country. Uh, I tended to agree. Uh, as the species is tall, it can prevent light reaching the native species lower to the ground. Um, however, when I took my, when I looked through my Western lens of knowing the landscape, I saw the serrated tussock as a big threat. Uh, this is an invasive perennial or long lived species, and it's the weed pictured on the right. And that's because this species can be really competitive and exclude almost all other species and has been proven really difficult to manage in a lot of places in, in the volcanic plains. Now, we each saw the landscape differently and the reasons for our different interpretations largely reflected the two ways of knowing. Sean, with his traditional lens, saw that the wild oak was extensive, tall, and to him symbolised colonial occupation of the land, which indicated that the country is sick. For me, the serrated tussock was the greatest threat to the native grassland species that remained, as it's well documented in the grassland literature. Now, neither view is more correct than the other, and it is both are deemed, and if both are deemed important, then reducing the threat posed by each will result in good outcomes for Point Lilius grassland, irrespective of the viewpoint. So it was these discussions that I felt were really valuable to me and helped me to gain a greater appreciation of the different ways of knowing. So next slide, please, Chase. So some of these threats and values allowed us to identify some objectives for the project. Um, and so these, you know, largely reflect those values. We wanted to reduce the cover of the high threat weeds. And these are weeds that as a collective, we identified as being particularly um, threatening at the site. Um, we wanted to maintain the integrity of the cultural sites. So, um, so weeds can pose a large threat to, to, to the location and identity of those sites. And we wanted to promote native species recovery. Um, you know, shift the balance back in the favour of natives if we can. You know, eliminating weeds, as John mentioned, might not be a, a reality in some places, but at least we want to shift that balance back in favour of natives. 
Next slide, please, Chase. Hopefully I'm going to time. Um, while I won't go into the details of the method, some aspects that motivated some of the decision making were that it was fit for, fit for purpose, that it represents the values of both traditional and Western knowledge and was co-developed, so it's compatible with cultural values. Uh, in addition, we want it to be scalable so we can infer implications of management at both small and large scales. We wanted it to be rapid, to, to lower costs and cover a greater area of the Point Lilia study area. Uh, we wanted to require minimal training so that we, you know, anyone with a basic understanding of plants could conduct the method. And it was also field tested. So we met on country, we discussed these things, we went back to the office, we came up with some ideas and we tested these ideas when we rejoined back on country. And it's also adaptable so that if we, new values come to, to the fore, they can be incorporated into the program over time. So next slide, Chase. So this is where we kind of want to round it out. We've kind of been on a journey about what is two ways of knowing, um, how does it work and uh, how can it be applied? What are the challenges faced when trying to apply it? And then how we how we went about applying it in this this small case study at, at Point Lilius. Um, coming back around, you know, did we achieve our goal, um, which was, you know, to bring the different ways of knowing together? Um, I think we did. Um, through our discussions on country, all participants made progress on attaining a more holistic view of VVP grasslands in both directions. And we found ways to incorporate this into the monitoring methods. Uh, while the project's in its infancy and COVID has certainly thrown a spanner in the works in terms of collecting data, um, the pursuit of this presentation and the ensuing conversations between Wadarong, ARI, other agencies like CMAs and other partners um, has fast-tracked this thinking, I think. It's led to new projects and the, net, the, the idea has now been placed in the hands of many other people. We've got an almost 200 people here today, so I hope that, um, that everyone takes something away from this and that they can, can use themselves. We hope that by communicating these ideas in this format will help others bridge that gap and um, be willing to view the landscape through a different lens for the benefit of environment and our society. Uh, and lastly, Chase, we just both wanted to acknowledge a number of people. Um, there were tons of individuals and, and organisations to thank for contributing to this work, far too many to place on this slide, but there's a short list. Um, and I think that's that's all from us. I'm hoping that perhaps um, my colleague at ARI, Andy, is slipping in a few little links that um, that might be useful for people who has um, who who um, are looking to expand some of this thinking. Thanks very much, and thanks, Chase. Thank you very much, Chase and Bray. That was um, lovely. It kind of just reminds us that you know it's really important to take in multiple perspectives. Um, use our listening skills and really bring that knowledge together. So that's fantastic. So people are kind of noting that um, it was a great presentation highlighting traditional ecological knowledge, discussing the aspects of sharing two-way knowledge is an important attribute to include when forming, informing land management. So, um, you know, there's some very significant um, information there. So that was fantastic. Um, I can't see any direct questions for you both, but I guess one from me is really about, you know, um, this is something about developing relationships and taking a very long time to kind of really understand, um, uh, you know, a process of, of, of knowledge. Uh, how did, for, for both of you, you know, what's, did you have in your head a, a time scale that you were kind of looking to kind of build this into, into your approach? Or how long did it actually take you, do you think? Do you mean in terms of this specific project or just the yeah. ideas sort of perforating into the way that we think in general? I was thinking more this um, specific project, but you can talk to both if you like. Uh, look, uh, from my perspective, um, you know, this was a, was a small project. It was, it sort of, it came up quickly and um, and it, it didn't have a lot of allocation of funds for 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 allowing us to have a lot of time to spend together. But what we did do was we made sure that the, the time we did spend together was on country and it was in a really um, sort of uh, uh, safe and familiar and um, collaborative environment. And I think that that was a real key to, to sort of us progressing. You know, this project, like many small projects, you know, it can be achieved and done and then you move on to the next one. But this was one that really kind of stuck with me in particular and I think Chase as well where you know, we felt like although it was a small project, a lot was gained in the small time that we spent together and it was a really important and good opportunity to kind of bring it to the fore in this format. So, um, yeah, that would be my impression. Did you have anything to add there, Chase? 
No, I think you nailed it there, Brad. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers um, there's mate. a couple more questions, I guess, on your pr approach. Um, one about whether it could be applied to private land or um, be replicated on linear corridors even. Sure. Well, great questions. You know, essentially this approach can be applied anywhere, I, I would think. Um, but, you know, in, in a sense of the private estate, yeah, look, that's an area where I work closely. I, I do work on grassland and, and grassy woodland projects in the private estate and the VVP. And um, I, and there are there are examples where, where there are kind of um, or plans to implement cultural burns on, on some of these properties. So there's, there's, you know, to some extent we've got many, many ways of knowing, you know, the, the two dominant ones are via, you know, Western views of science and traditional um, knowledge. But, you know, you've got other subsets of views as well from private landholders and, and other ways of viewing a landscape and interpreting change and thinking of ways to make it better. So I think there's a lot of scope to really expand some of these ideas in, into some of those other spaces. And I think there's already some early progress in terms of landholders willing to, 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 to work with some of these ideas. And, um, and yeah, I think ultimately that holistic view uh, that incorporates a number of different value sets will ultimately benefit uh, conservation outcomes. They might take a little while to, to, to come to the fore, but I think ultimately that, that is an achievable thing. And it looks like it's not about um, um, arguing about the, the diversity of issues, it's about where you're finding commonality um, in management or, or values, those kinds of things. So that's, um, I think, really positive. Uh, there is a question there about, uh, sorry, I've lost it now, because uh, there's a few more coming through. Uh, does the traditional owner site, so Steve Murphy's asking if the traditional owner site assessment looks more at plant structure than plant species diversity. So, so, uh, so sorry. Can you can you repeat that? I missed the start. So it was it was around cultural. Yeah. So does the traditional owner site assessment look more at plant structure structure than plant diversity? So sorry, I, I sort of misinterpreted the. So that I didn't go into the methods, and and so they are coarse. Uh, in the sense that they wanted to be rapid and they could be done by lots of people with a, you know, various backgrounds. So it, it, it largely revolves at the moment, and of course it's adaptable, but it revolves around the structure um, and the dominant kind of um, types of plants. We see grasses and, and forbs and its origin, whether they're native or exotic. And then it's kind of got that focus on the threats. So where we're, where we're looking at the threats, we are identifying those threats to the species level and so you know we're, we're trying to track individual species through time but the species we're tracking are, are more the weeds the threats and the values we kind of capturing through these other metrics structure is a really good one obviously really important in grasslands as well you know uh, John alluded to the fact that these grasslands if they're left unmanaged they can essentially outgrow themselves and, and smother themselves mm -hmm. um, and there are important aspects of structure that we, we, um, we're targeting as well through through the monitoring program. So we're trying to capture that information as well. Thanks, Brad. Um, we've hit 11 o'clock, so we'll continue on. But thank you very much to you both. There are some more questions in there. You're welcome to have a look at those and um, see if you like them.